Give me an M. M. in the United States of America 
in the area of race relations and what exactly is the, the, the role of the church to try to bring about reconciliation and racial understanding among the, people, the, the various groups in, in the United States of America. Harris listened to me attentively then he said, Sam, I've got news for you. Let me ask you a question this way. In fact, you and I were to go back to Georgia, to Savannah, my hometown, and I, you and I were to try to attend church service <coughs> at my home church. We will both be turned away. And then after that, the minister might call me, uh, Harris Copley, into his office and give me a tongue lashing for having the, the audacity to try to, eat, to bring a black person to worship uh, in that church. Well, as you can well imagine, in my innocence, but in my strong Christian conviction, I was devastated. That subject became a subject that Harris and I discussed over and over again, whenever the civil rights activities in the United States were making headlines in my part of the world. And unbeknownst to me, Harris began sending out letters of application on my behalf to Southern Baptist Universities. And the response came, responses came, one after the other, predictably, you guessed it, no, thank you, no, except for Mercer University that decided, well, Dr. Rufus Harris was being foolhardy, wasn't he? <laughs> he decided to give me a chance. And it would have all worked out well, except that an event of that nature you couldn't have kept on the wrap. So word got out. And the Georgia Baptist Churches uh, had a very close relationship with Mercy University. University. Word got out, and as a friend of mine like to put it very delicately, and the watching me call it hit the fan. <laughs> It resulted in a, in, a, in a long debate, acrimonious, vitriolic. <coughs> Dr. Rufus Allen was subjected to savagery, to condemnation. But he held his ground. He held his ground. And as I understand it, the, the Baptists, my friends the Baptists, like to pride themselves on one thing being what? Very democratic. So a committee was formed and Dr. Ru uh, Walter Moore was the chairman <coughs> of that committee. And that committee recommended to the Georgia Baptist Convention or to the Board of Trustees that indeed Sam Oni should be given admission to Mercer University. It took me a year, we took a whole year to finally get that word. When I got the word that I was accepted, of course I was, I was late, delighted. At that very time, there was one of the first batch of Peace Corps volunteers. One was, uh, two of them actually, were teaching at my high school. One by the name of Ray Spriggs, an African American man from uh, Philadelphia, Heard about the, about the news, heard, got the news, and then he invited me to his office. And he said, Sam, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. Don't go to Mercer University in Georgia. You know what has been happening to James Meredith? James Meredith was, uh, you know, I, I, I hope I get to meet him one of these things, we're more or less contemporaries. In Mississippi, don't go. If it is an American education that you want, I can assure you a place at my alma mater, which was Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. I listened to him respectfully, he was my teacher, and I said to him, I felt, I thanked him, and I said, I felt that this was a mission that the good Lord had imposed on me, and I had to carry it out. And that was the beginning of my journey. Then only did I know that I was going to meet a young man by the name of Donald Baxter. Then only did I know that I was going to meet another man by the name of Joseph Hendricks. 
I got the letter, I was ready to come, and then it suddenly occurred to me that I didn't have any money for my airline ticket. <laughs> and I said, no, Ghana, the distance between Ghana and uh, Georgia, making Georgia, is a, few, a few thousand miles. <laughs> there was no hitchhiking wasn't going to cut it. <laughs> In high school, I've been very, very active in the student YMCA. And those were the days when the YMCA was taken a bit more seriously than now. In those days, the most important letter in those four letters was what? The C, Young Men's Christian Association. I think every other letter has been dropped now. We're left with what, just the Y? And it's a place where you go to pump iron, and uh, build those muscles. So the German YMCA would took the business, actually they, 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 they considered it a, a Christian, almost like a, a Christian denomination. They had sent a, a missionary to Ghana, and uh, Fritz Pavelsic was his name. He and I became friends. So I told, I said, Fritz, you know I've been waiting all year to, to get word from Mercer University whether they were going to accept me or not. Now I have the letter of admission, but I have no way of paying, my, uh, paying for my airline ticket. And so Fritz said to me, Sam, don't worry about it. I'm going home on vacation, and when I get to Germany, I'll mention you to the German YMCA. They already knew about you anyway. They already knew about me because Fritz Pavelsic had, had, Fritz Pavelsic had written a book about me. And so he went home, and about two weeks later, I got a letter of invitation from the German YMCA. I said, come on, come, uh, we'll pay your way to the United States. But as a condition for paying your way, we also insist that you come to Germany for the summer. So I accepted the invitation, and I went on to Germany, and um, I spoke to different uh, Telslager. It's what they call uh, camps, young people's camps, summer camps. And spoke about the book that Fritz had written about me. And when I was ready to leave Germany, they gave me a letter of introduction to the president of the American YMCA in New York City. And I went to see him when I got to um, uh, New York. He put me up in the hostel in, on, in Manhattan and then as I was ready to head for Georgia, he gave me a letter of introduction to the YMCA in Atlanta. I got on the train and I arrived in Atlanta without any incident whatsoever. This was all 1963. So I got into a taxi and um, to the YMCA at um, uh, Butler Street YMCA in Atlanta. I go there and I asked for Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy came to the front and I handed, introduced myself and handed him the, the, the letter. So he went back into his office and a few minutes later he came back and he said, Mr. Oni, I'm sorry to tell you that uh, we can't let you stay here. But I can arrange for you to go to the ITC. ITC, the, some of you may know, is the International Theological Center I think it, it was on the, it's on the Atlanta Black University, uh, uh, University area. And so I ended up uh, at uh, ITC. And while I was there, some of the students found out what I was doing, and uh, one thing led to another. Oh, no, I, had also, I also had a letter from the president of the YMCA for Dr. Benjamin Mays, president of Morehouse University. So I went over to see Dr. Mays, and in his office was uh, Horace Mann Bond, some of the name familiar, Alan, um, uh, Julian Bond's father, who was the dean of students at Morehouse. So I handed him the letter. He, they were both very happy to see me. And after reading the letter, Dr. Mays looked at me and said, Sam, don't you think you should stay here at Morehouse than going to Mercer, Mercer University in Georgia because it may prove too challenging for you. And again, as, as I did on the occasion with uh, uh, Ray Spriggs, 
I looked at him and I said, I believe that the good Lord had given me this assignment. And I wasn't about to uh, uh, turn my back on the, on the assignment. So that's how I ended up uh, arriving in Macon. Waiting at the railway, railroad station to meet was Joseph Hendricks and uh, John, Johnny, Mitchell. Johnny Mitchell, who was the uh, director of admissions. They met me and they brought me to the campus. I think I arrived on a Friday and I checked into the, uh, my I met Don and we checked into our room in Sherwood Hall. The remarkable thing, an incident that Don has already referred to, had to do with the Reverend Dr. Clifton Forrester, the then minister of Tatnall Square Baptist Church. That afternoon, there was a knock on our, on our door, and we opened the door, and there was this distinguished looking gentleman who then proceeded to introduce himself, and we introduced ourselves too. Then he said to me, Sam, I've just come to tell you, to let you know that you won't be welcome to worship at Tatnall Square Baptist Church. I was bewildered. I don't know how Don was feeling, but uh, I think it was, his was a mixture of anger and, uh, and puzzlement. But see, by what Dr. Forrester didn't know that we had made up our minds that Vineville Baptist Church was where we were going to go to worship for the simple reason that Dr. Walter Moore had had the vision and the wisdom and the courage to recommend that I be admitted. So I, the, the assumption, the belief that we had was that he would have blessed his congregation to think the same way as himself. So we, told, we thanked the, uh, Dr. Clifton Forrester and we assured him that we won't at all be that he had nothing to worry about. We won't be coming to Tatnall Square Baptist Church that, that Sunday. And uh, he turned around and sheepishly walked out of our room. On Sunday, we proceeded to uh, Vineville Baptist Church, first to Sunday school, and where everything went well. Uh, everything went well partly because most of the people in that class were students from Mercer. Then we proceeded to the sanctuary for the morning worship. And hymns were sung and prayers were prayed and, uh, and uh, the sermon was given. At the end of which, as you know, the, the formality in Southern Baptist churches, Reverend Walter Moore invited uh, people who might be interested in becoming members of the church and also visitors to please uh, uh, lined up before the congregation. So, so that a, a welcome could be, uh, they, they could be welcome into the congregation. So they all lined up. We all lined up, including myself. And then Dr. Moore said, asked everybody to go back and sit down, except for me. Then he proceeded to introduce me. Brothers and sisters, we're honored this morning to have in our, in our congregation, in our fellowship, a young man who came to know the Lord through our own missionary uh, giving and, and e enterprise. In mid-sentence, he was cut off. A man jumped on his feet. Reverend Moore, I'm not going to sit here and watch you destroy this church by bringing a nigger into the congregation. Now, mind you, it was my first Sunday in America, first Sunday in a Southern Baptist church, the Southern Baptist Church that belongs to the same Southern Baptist Convention that has been sending missionaries to my part of the world since 1850. So before the man, this angry man was done, a lady was on her feet all red in the face uh, and spoke in the same vitriolic vein. Before she was done, another man was on his feet, spoke in the same angry vein. Finally, again, this is so that a Baptist uh, institution we're talking about. Democracy, right? So what Dr. Moore said, let's put the matter to a vote. Those in favor of Sam O'Neill's membership, please raise your hands. The hands went up. Those opposed, the hands went up. But the diehards won't give in. 
So the vote was taken the second time. They still won't give in. So Dr. Moore said, well, let's do a standing vote. And it was clear to Dr. Moore and me, because we are the two facing this very hospitable, uh, warm <laughs> congregation. So those opposed, please stand up. They stood up. Those, I mean, those, those in favor, please stand up. Opposed, stand up. It was then, at long last, that what has been clear all along, but I suppose the, the diehards were hoping that maybe there might be a shift in their favor. Finally, they threw in the towel, and that was how I was, with love and uh, excitement, <laughs> welcome into the house of worship, my first Sunday in America, among the very same people that sent Dr. Thomas Bowen in 1850 to Obomosho in Yoruba land, where I'm from. Well, from that Sunday on, it was downhill. Because if I happen to be the first person on a pew, I will be the only one. And the, the tension in the sanctuary was such, was so palpable, you could almost slice it with a knife. And nothing in my view could be more counterproductive to the worshipful uh, atmosphere. So obviously it didn't take long before I found my way out of Vineville Baptist Church. But I'm, I'm, there are other in, in, incidents that I could cite. I don't want us to dwell too much on the negative or the past. Because whether we like it or not, we do not live in the past. Whether we like it or not, we do not live in the future either. What are we left with? We're left with the here and now, and it's so appropriately called what? The present. And it is a gift. It is a gift. That is why celebrating mercy is important here and now. By the way, Dr. Dr. President Underwood and I and uh, Richard Swindle were talking about the need to bring the two campuses together, the one, the one in Atlanta. Maybe we can persuade them to move here and then we can <laughs> take over Tattnall Square. Uh, Tattnall's, we're certainly not moving to Atlanta, that's for sure. But the here and now is what we have. And we're called, each one of us, touched by grace. Just as my brother Don was touched by grace, that led him to say, yes, I will, I will be glad to be Sam's roommate. And not only say so, what he didn't tell you was, yes, I arrived, I think, with the clothes on my back and maybe another pair of pants and a jacket. I had never, I was telling another group, I think that was in Atlanta. I wore my first pair of shoes when I was 12 years old. Now, before you begin to feel sorry for me, uh, the truth of the matter was it didn't matter because when you know, we were in the Gold Coast, we were going home to Nigeria to visit, and so we wanted to make an impression, you know. So, and I knew how uncomfortable those shoes were. And my mother would say, look, Sam, we're going to church on Sunday. You're keeping those shoes on. I don't care what you do with them after we come back, but keep those shoes on in church. So I didn't have my pair of, I said, everybody around you was poor. Therefore, it didn't, it was the norm. But we were happy. We had parents that, that were devoted to us, that cared about us. We had friends, we played, we made our own toys, and so on and so forth. But I arrived with, you know, the proverbial $50 in your pocket. I don't even think I have 50 cents in my pocket. This young man, the first thing he did was, Sam, we need to go shopping. Don has a way of being very, very modest but he's an amazingly generous human being. It's, um, I think uh, uh, Francis will testify to that, being his wife. He's an amazingly kind-hearted, generous man, and it's not because he's sitting here. 
So we went downtown. I think there was a kind of an outlet where a sec, you know, these, with these manufactured uh, shirts and things, and they're not quite the right. Maybe something is wrong with the. There was a factory near here. We went there first, and we bought some shirts, and then we ended up at that uh, rather upscale. Uh, what was the name of the Tops. Tops. Uh, sounds like Neiman Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> But we ended up there when and Don, Don bought me, bought me uh, a suit, a tie, and I think a pair of shoes too. I think I came, I arrived here with a pair of sandals, something like that. And uh, that's what I wore to, and I think I cut a very dash, dashing figure going to, <laughs> go, going to Bible Baptist Church that first Sunday. That was the kind of a man he was and he is. And I can never thank you enough for that. I can never thank Joe Hendricks, whom I call the conscience of this university. I can never thank him enough. Now, Joe was different. Joe was excruciatingly modest. Um, but he, was, he had a large heart. He was, a, again, a man touched by grace. And being with Joe, you could feel that you are blessed to be in the presence, in the company of this man. I can never thank him enough. I can never thank Dr. Robert Otto. These are all the people, you know, when, and I was so excited when, when uh, Dr., I mean, President Underwood said to me, uh, invited me to this and said, uh, Don Baxter's coming. I said, well, it's about time. Somebody realized that, yes, heroes are heroes, because that's what some of you think of me, right? <laughs> no, but no, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay to have heroes, but be very, very careful. Hero worshiping is a no-no. Hero worshiping is a no-no. But behind any hero, think of them. There are many, many others that contribute. Think of the civil rights movement. We know of, the, of Dr. King, uh, Andrew Young, Ralph Abernathy, but you know the many people who, in, 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 who, fell, who were felled by the fire hoses. 1963, if I may digress a bit, was a, a pivotal year. I, mean, I kept saying to myself, this is America? The first thing that jolted me to my very foundation was the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. Do you remember that? Four little girls. They were doing nothing other than assemble in the house of God to worship God. And somebody took a bomb and tossed it into that church building. And those four little girls were wiped out. Not long after that, three civil rights workers, and the civil rights movement, uh, uh, by the way, don't let anybody f uh, deceive you about it. It was a collaboration between blacks and white, especially between blacks and our Jewish brothers and sisters who have also known what it, me what it, me what it is to be persecuted. This is what, 47 years later? And the, the names have emblazoned on my consciousness. Cheney, Goodman, does anybody else remember? Schwerner. Two Jewish men, one black man, were murdered in cold blood. Are you ready for this irony? In a place called Philadelphia, meaning what? City of brotherly love. And then I remember finishing my last year in high school, John Kennedy was elected, and people, people of my generation, I mean, that was when we were just on the verge of becoming independent too. No, actually, we had become independent uh, five years earlier. And we were impressed by this young, dashing young man, President of the United States. Well, I arrived in August, September that year, and in November, wasn't it, November 63? He was gone. And I'm saying to myself, this is America? This is the place where all these good people 
godly people came to my people with the, 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 the preaching the gospel of, of brotherly love, it was difficult. But I think one of the unsung heroes of that era was a man by the name of Lemuel Penn. Anybody remembers Lemuel Penn? Mm -hmm. He was a native Georgian, happened to have belonged to the, I think it was the Army Reserve, and had gone to do, perform his reserve duty for that weekend, was driving home on the freeway in Georgia. Somebody picked up a gun and blew his brains out. So those were the things that, were, that were, I was living through. And I wouldn't have survived it were it not for all some of these good people. You know, I referred to uh, Tatno Square Baptist Church a few minutes ago. Sometimes in 2002, way after the fact, I got a letter from somebody I didn't know. The return address on the envelope said, David Griffin. And I'm scratching my brain and I'm saying, wasn't there a Professor Griffith? Uh, in, was it in? And I thought, could it have been the professor? Uh, I think I took a class or two from him. Perhaps he heard that I've returned to Georgia and was uh, you know, writing a, letter, a welcome letter or something like that. So I, I opened the letter. It was a three-page letter. And it was written by this young man who belonged to Tatno Square Baptist Church. Must have been a youngster when the event of 1966 happened. And he wrote, begging me for forgiveness for what had happened to me some uh, 30 years previously. I read the letter. I was so deeply moved. I, I picked up the phone and I called the young man. David Griff, Griffin, are you here today? David, please stand up and I want my, my, my family here to, to greet you. That's David Griffin. I use the term so-called because my personal belief is the entire racial construct is an absurdity. It is fiction. Let's see. I would like to, is there a white person in the audience? Is that a white person? Francis, do you feel white? <laughs> hmm? We also speak of yellow people, don't we? Yeah? Anybody met a yellow man, yellow woman? How about brown people? Brown people? Uh, Bill Underwood, have you met a brown person? <laughs> a black man, a black woman? The absurdity of it is manifested in the fact we can't even find the right, right coloration to, 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 to pin on each one of us. And since that is such an absurdity, why don't we just, just forget it and accept one another as what? Members of the human race, but more important than that, members of God's family and therefore what? Brothers and sisters. We have to find the grace to do so. The great uh, black thinker, W.E.B. Du Dubois, as, uh, where is ha uh, Randy Hashberger would say, will correct me. Uh, Dubois, <laughs> n'est-ce pas? <laughs> W.E.B. Dubois said, this, 20th century, it was going to be the, is, is going to be the century of the color line. And he was right. That was when the struggle really began. Well, we're now in the 21st century, Mary. Yes. I want to invite all of you. John, I want to invite all of you to join in this effort to help this nation which is a beacon on a hill, as far as the entire world is concerned, to finally transcend, to finally overcome these artificial boundaries that we've built between, between us. In so doing, we will be bearing witness to the fact that we have indeed been, by, been touched by what? By God's good grace. There was another person, there were several others, and I'm sure I'm going to commit the awful sin of leaving so many people out that made my experience here so 
uh, uh, so bearable. I got a call from a Dr. Goodman one, one evening. He introduced himself and he said he would like to invite me to worship with, with, with his congregation at a synagogue. I'd never been to a synagogue. And I thought, well, given the fact that no other uh, uh, church, Baptist or otherwise, has invited me, I'll, I'll, I'll take, take the invitation. So I accepted the invitation, and I think there were a few other. We had, in those days, uh, maybe half a dozen foreign students, all told. So we all, we all went to the synagogue, and we worshiped with, the, with our Jewish brothers and sisters. And the most memorable item of that worship was the cantor singing. Uh, I thought that was so moving. And unfortunately, Dr. Good Goodman is no longer with us. And I had heard that his son, he had a son. Uh, again, sadly, his, his son isn't here with us either. But I understand that Mrs. Goodman's wife, uh, Mr. Goodman's wife, Janet Goodman, is Janet Goodman here? I didn't. Ah, please, let's go all greet. Thank you so much. I could go on and on, but I won't. <laughs> I want to just say this final thing, that if God has been so good to us, even in times of difficulty, difficulties, but still sustains us by his grace, who am I to withhold my grace from my brother or my sister? Forgiveness also plays a crucial role here. And how can I forgive a white person? Look at all they did in the days of slavery and segregation and all that. God said, you've got to transcend that. You remember, you remember it was one of the disciples that asked Jesus, you know, you've been talking about forgiveness. Forgive, how often shall we forgive somebody that sins against us? And I'm sure the poor guy was thinking, Jesus was going to say, well, maybe two, three times, you know, and then uh, the, next, the, next, the, the, the next time, fourth time, let him have it. <laughs> and Jesus said, seven times, 70 times. In other words, we must never cease forgiving. And before you begin thinking, well, that would really make a noble person of me, you know, if I can forgive those who sin against me. It is, uh, who was it? Yeah, the Bard says it, I think, if I can paraphrase, if I remember the line. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth like a gentle rain from heaven up upon the, the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives, and him that takes. So the act of forgiveness is, is a mutuality. The forgiver is liberated, just as the forgiven is equally liberated. And I believe that this is what we need in our own little ways to begin to bring about the change that we want. Gandhi said it, be the change that what? that you want in the world. Be the change that you want in the world. Finally, we cannot leave here. I'm filled with gratitude. And I, I think we, each one of us ought to develop an attitude. We all ought to get an attitude of gratitude, constantly. Not only thanking the person who open, holds the door for you, although these days when you hold the door open for a lady, you feel that maybe you've committed one of the most heinous crimes. But you do it. Every little bit counts. Somebody said, the world, you cannot do all the good that the world needs, but you can do what? The world needs all the good that you can do. You cannot do all the good that the world needs, but the world needs all the good that you can do. So 
let us take this moment of celebration, of commemoration, as a shining moment that sort of inspires all of us to move on, to begin to gradually knock down those walls, those artificial walls that society has created. Let us be the new generation in this 21st century that will do whatever we can, just as Rufus Harris, I think that was the vision he had when he took that courageous step. But before I close, I think I'll be remiss if I don't mention one family that has in fact become my family. About two weeks after I arrived at Mercer, I was already homesick. So every day I would rush to the post office uh, the post office is now used for, uh, anyway, it's part of the, the, uh, uh, the old student union, to check my mail. And the campus, well, the campus still remains open, so people in the surrounding uh, vicinity then will come. And as I was leaving the post office one day, a man walks towards me and he said, my name is Charles Davis, and I introduced myself. Well, but he, then he proceeds, you must be Sam Oni. I said, yes. He said, well, we've been following your, your odyssey, and we're so proud to have you here at Mercer. My wife and I would like for you to come have dinner with us. And I said, fine. So a few days later, he came to get me, and we went to their home. We had dinner, and after dinner, Charles handed me a key. And he said, Sam, this is the key to our home. We want you to know that our home will be your home away from home. That was 47 years ago, and I still remain a member of the Davis family. That's, again, an act of grace by a couple whose lives have been touched by God's grace. Finally, I can't um, I conclude by talking about another family that I came very close to. Through, when I left Vineville Baptist Church, I was really, uh, some of you who, in, my, in the remarks that I make during the uh, 94 Founders Days, I, for me, the most telling statement I made in that, in that uh, speech was that it was a faith-shattering experience. I left the uh, uh, Vineville Baptist Church and I was sort of a, a casting about for a place of worship. Then Charles and Eunice said to me, why don't you come to Mount Olive Baptist Church with us? So I began going to Mount Olive, which is just down the Oglethorpe. Yeah, just a stone throw from, from uh, here. And it was there that I met a beautiful young woman by the name of Gloria. And I thought to myself, Wow. <laughs> and uh, Charles said, well, you know, she's a nice person. She's in a college in Atlanta. You know, go talk to her. And uh, so I, I started making my move, you know, thinking that uh, I might be lucky. And I tried. And tried. And tried again. But... Stonewall. In the meantime, I had sort of worked my way into the Cornelius family. Jackson Street, again, just down the street. It was near enough, convenient enough, and so whenever uh, Gloria will come back, come home from the university in Atlanta where she was, I was her because I had a network of family members that would say, Gloria is going to be home this weekend, you know. Or, or, so I tried and tried. Uh, Gloria will not give me the light of day. <laughs> but we remain good friends, and her family, almost just as the Davis family, remain my family as well. And I'm delighted to introduce to you today my dear friend, Gloria Hicks. You cannot do all the goods that the all the good that the world needs, but the world needs all the little good that you can do. Let us take with God's grace, take that as our charge. Let's take that as our calling. And let's begin to make the change 
be the change that we want in the world. Let it begin right here at Mercer University. Thank you so, so much. May the good Lord continue to bless you, each and every one of you.